Biodiversity in ecosystems is a key component to sustaining life within the natural world. Biodiversity can be analyzed at different scales. One scale of biodiversity is genetic diversity, or the total number of genetic characteristics in the genome of a species. In other words, it looks at how different members of the same population can be from each other. The different colors in this kernel of corn is the result of genetic diversity. Diversity can also be observed at the species level. Species diversity is the number and abundance of each species that lives in a particular area. But species diversity is really a measure of two things. Species richness is how many different species are present in a community. Species evenness refers to how close in numbers each species is. So here we see two different communities. Both community one and community two have the same species richness. They contain the four same tree species. But take a look at how those species are distributed. In community two, there is a dominant species that vastly outnumbers the other trees. So despite having the same number of species, community two is less biodiverse because it has lower species evenness. The final scale of biodiversity is habitat diversity. And habitat diversity is the number of different habitats that one region can provide. The image we see here is an example of habitat diversity. It's all of the different habitats that are present in a mountain range. The greater the diversity of habitat, the more exploitable niches there are. Now you may have heard that a niche is the role an organism plays in its environment, but a more precise understanding of the niche concept is how organisms respond to the distribution of available habitats and resources in an area. An organism's niche then becomes the relationship between what uh, resources are available in a habitat and how organisms utilize those available resources. Well, from the perspective of the total biosphere, we've got biodiversity, though Estimates vary. There are currently about 8.7 million different species inhabiting our planet right now. So how did we get so many different things? Well, the theory of evolution is our explanation for biodiversity. And the mechanism underlying the process of evolution is natural selection. And natural selection relies on four basic principles. Number one, individuals of a population have some sort of genetic variation that is heritable. Number two, more individuals are born in a population than can possibly supported by the environment. Individuals with the best variation of genes are more likely to survive and reproduce. Adaptation is the term we use to describe the traits that are uniquely suited to an organism's survival in a particular habitat. And number four, the traits that are best suited to survival will be passed down to offspring. Repeat this process for multiple generations and you get speciation or the emergence of a new species. Speciation as a process relies on some population of organisms being separated. Perhaps a small group migrated to a different area or some event caused a population to split like a flood. Over time, those two split populations of organisms will experience slightly different environmental conditions. And as a result, a whole myriad of genetic mutations is going to accumulate in their genetic code the two populations eventually become so different genetically that they can no longer reproduce between each other. Now, when individuals from two populations that have been separated can no longer produce offspring, 
it is said that the two groups are a different species. While this process generally happens slowly over thousands and millions of years, there are some examples of rapid speciation events. Rapid speciation events occur when there is a drastic change in the environment, which opens up new conditions, and therefore more exploitable niches. The most common example of this is the Cambrian explosion, where an increase in available oxygen in the ocean sparked such a rapid speciation event that resulted in the emergence of virtually every single phylum that we see in the animal kingdom. Natural selection and evolution has resulted in the speciation of all life, and most organisms can be classified into two categories based on their niche, specialist species and generalist species. All species have some sort of ecological tolerance, or the range of conditions like temperature, salinity, sunlight, or even their food choices that an organism can endure before death or injury occurs. This can be modeled out with a tolerance curve. Here's an example of a tolerance curve for water temperature for a steelhead trout. We see that there is an optimal zone where all the individual members of the species do best. Notice, however, that there are individuals of this species that can survive in much colder and much warmer conditions. A specialist species is a species with a very narrow ecological tolerance curve. These are organisms that require very unique resources or they have a very limited diet or need a specific habitat to survive. An example of a specialist species is this koala. And koalas are adapted to survive exclusively on eucalyptus leaf. In any other habitat, a koala would not survive. A generalist species is a species with a very wide ecological tolerance curve. These are organisms that are able to thrive in a wide variety of environmental conditions and can use a lot of different resources. An example of this is a rat, which can survive pretty much anywhere aside from the polar Arctic regions of the planet. Islands are a bit of a special case in biodiversity. Organisms on islands are also susceptible to the same evolutionary forces as their mainland relatives, but the speciation rates and the extinction rates on islands is a lot higher. Biodiversity on islands is further described by the theory of island biogeography. And this theory proposes two generalities. Number one, larger islands have more biodiversity. And number two, islands closer to the nearest continental mainland have more biodiversity. Let's take a look at why. Larger islands are bigger targets, so species can find them more easily. A migrating species that is just flying over the water trying to find something is more likely to come across a bigger island than it is to come across a smaller island. The same idea kind of applies to islands that are closer to the mainland. If an island is closer to the mainland, it is going to acquire more species migrating to that island simply because it is closer, therefore it is easier to find, and it is more likely that a population of organisms will colonize a closer island than a farther island. Now, why is biodiversity important? Why do we care that the environment can support a large number of species? Well, all the organisms in an ecosystem fulfill a vital niche that is important to the functioning of that ecosystem as a whole. Protecting biodiversity is vital if we want to keep these beautiful environments for future generations but there is also economic incentive. We need to remember that the environment is not an isolated system in our lives. 
everything must be thought of in the context of the global community. The framework of socio-ecological systems proposes a triumvirate of interconnected factors. Society, the economy, and the environment are inherently linked and they affect each other. Let's face it, we rely on the environment to support our society and our economy. In 1997, Robert Costanza, a very famous professor from Portland State University in Oregon, he and his colleagues first estimated that ecosystem services worldwide are worth about $33 trillion. In today's money, accounting for inflation, that is $52 trillion worth of economic value we get out of ecosystems. Ecosystem services are the benefits to humans from the natural environment and from healthy ecosystems. And we've kind of broken them down into four main categories. Provisioning services are goods produced by ecosystems like food and timber. Regulating services are benefits from the regulation of ecosystem processes. These include pollination, flood water absorption, which mitigates flood damage, and pest regulation, where some animals, well, eat the things that annoy us. Cultural services are non-material benefits that we gain from ecosystems, like hiking and other recreational activities. Support services are factors that are necessary for the production of all the other services. These are things like primary productivity and the biogeochemical cycling that continues to recycle the nutrients that ecosystems need to, well, continue to service us. These ecosystem services are only possible if biodiversity is maintained. Human activities can disrupt these services and in turn have economic consequences. So if preserving the natural world because it's the right thing isn't enough for you, perhaps preserving the natural world because it is financially the best thing to do might be the incentive that we should be spreading as environmental educators and communicators. The next video will continue to explore topics in biodiversity, especially how biodiversity can change over time.